branch up a little bit today about the, the API app store scene and then kind of close with, uh, with Fire, which is what Josh has worked on so much, and, um, and kind of how we think Fire can help solve what is hopefully going to be part of solving this integration challenge and this interoperability challenge so that people start having reliable ways to build things. But um, uh, I think at first, um, uh, I'll, well, I'll let Josh go ahead and introduce himself. He's got an illustrious background here. Hey, I'm Josh Mandel. I've been working for the last four years or so on a research project at Harvard Medical School uh, where we started from the question of if we could have APIs to build health apps that could hook into EHRs, uh, what would that look like? Uh, and it's been a long and, and interesting journey that has actually led me into the world of standards development, which I never thought I would have been a part of. Um, but, but now for the last year and a half, I've learned some things. I'm looking forward to sharing them. And so um, we've got some, uh, and I've known Josh for a couple of years, uh, met at the Blue Button Developer Conference a couple of years ago, and I've been talking about this, and as a, a med student uh, slash uh, lousy programmer who wanted to build things to solve things in my own hospital, uh, seeing how this uh, kind of prevented me from doing something that could be scaled or used just time and time and time again is, is sort of my fundamental motivation. And I'm, I'm taking my MPH work is on health policy, and that's what will kind of hopefully get you guys motivated tonight motivated tonight about how this is probably a policy issue. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and uh, invite the Rock Health uh, team. These, these are going to share some more stories uh, for integration pain with a, uh, uh, a human face on this, uh, this process. Oh, so like now? Okay. <laughs> so I'm Carolyn Jacek. I'm a pediatrician. Um, I Please don't throw eggs at me, but I am the clinical informaticist that you meet with at the big health institution that tells you that they want your software to integrate with our EHR. I just left UCSF two weeks ago where I ran the EPIC implementation for the new children's hospital that was um, that's down the street and also ran all of our um, provider-facing clinical system integrations. So that includes digital health and other things. So I have felt your pain, I have caused your pain. Um, and now, as of two weeks ago, I am now at Mango Health, which is a local startup focused on uh, adherence and focused specifically on medication adherence right now. And now I'm trying to, from the other side, really facilitate meaningful digital health integration with large health systems. So that's me. Hi, my name is Borna. I'm one of the co-founders of Agile MD. We're a startup from Rock Health uh, V2 Batch. And what we do is uh, help integrate clinical decision support tools into physician workflow. Uh, when we first started the company, we were very much focused on, on mobile apps. And you know, one of the things that we saw was that to, to really impact the, uh, the care decisions that clinicians were making, we needed to get as close as possible to their existing workflow. And, and a big part of that is being integrated with the EHR system. So we've been working with, uh, with large health systems on the integration of our tools into, uh, into their EHR systems, into Epic, into Cerner, and, and some of the other systems. So happy to talk about that, those experiences. Uh, my name is Tim Uh I'm a business developer with, sorry, this is loud enough. Uh, I'm with Dr. Prono. Uh, we are in a, a mobile uh, native iPad EHR, uh, so kind of in that same realm. And uh, I work with uh, and manage the API. Uh, we work with Borna together um, with the phone for some events, actually in person. Um, but uh, the end-to-end -end solution that we're trying to build out, it, it, it really rests upon some of the benefits and efficiencies that can be drawn upon the API and what you guys can build out. So it's, it's really exciting to work in that space and sort of see where uh, where our data can lead it and uh, hopefully be functional for uh, what you guys do. What was like your number one ask for this? One thing you guys even want to see from fire? Um, I mean, I would basically say, I think I just actually, it's really ironic I'm here. I just, with, with meeting with someone from the ONC, and we were talking about a lot of these issues. What I would like to see separate from FHIR, I think the number one issue is um, making open APIs part of meaningful use certification, either part of meaningful use or part of EHR certification, because I really feel like that's gonna be the thing that's gonna make, move the needle. Um, unfortunately, coming from a large health system, the only way that things change with the EHR is if it's part of meaningful use, we'll build it. Um, not to be negative, but that's true. And or our vendor will build it if it's part of um, EHR certification for high tech. So I think if I had to pick two things, I would say those would be the two things that I would pick that need to change. 
Um, and the good news is ONC is starting to have the conversation, so that's a good, a good thing. Does everyone know what ONC is? Yes, okay, good. What would you like yes, to Yes, yeah, so I, I, would, I would build on that just as well, because a lot, of the, a lot of what we're talking about, a lot of the technologies that we use when we're, we're talking with Dr. Corner about, these are, these are essentially plumbing to support the kind of uh, capabilities that, that all of our apps are doing, and it's, sometimes it's difficult to, to make the ROI case to build all of that infrastructure for one specific use case, but, uh, but having it be a part of meaningful use or something that essentially gets that plumbing in place then unlocks the ability to have uh, hundreds of these different use cases be enabled, so absolutely. Uh, I mean, for us, you know, fire's great, and we have obviously uh, our, our open API that what we've developed and we've allowed for um, is so that other developers like Borna, other people have, have partnered with us to be able to make something that, uh, and access data within an EMR that they can go ahead and build out what they like. Uh, we've made it open, we've added a bunch of endpoints, uh, all the fields and all the resources that we've, we've put into that API is so that you can take it and build with it what you will. Um, so, you know, as far as the, the standardized uh, you know, approach to it, it's, it's all well and good, and that, that's extremely exciting, I think, for healthcare in general. Uh, for us specifically, uh, the API was always meant to be something that we could just open up and let everyone do what they want. Um, and that's been sort of the, the, the exciting part about it. You get, you get so many requests, um, and all of them tend to have something interesting to build out. And to that point about the ROI, uh, when you make it open, it's, it's pretty easy to just let them, let them go off and, and do what they like. So it's, it's been fun so far. Right, just to get a quick check, um, does everybody, raise your hand if you do know what the acronym FIRE stands for. All right, it's about half the crowd. So FIRE, so do, raise your hand if you know what HL7 uh, stands for. Um, all right, um, so just kind of a little bit of a gauge. So you guys are aware that nothing can talk to each other in healthcare and the organization that uh, um, nominally provides solutions to this is called HL7. And the new standard that's uh, past couple years that's been evolving out of HL7 um, is called FIRE, so for fa Fast Health Interoperability Resources. Um, and it's, um, it's a, a pretty reasonable sort of put not only data model, but sort of exchange mechanism, mechanism HTTP base, uh, can deliver XML or JSON, um, and um, it also has a sort of traditional client uh, RESTful query structure uh, which is different than traditional HL7 messaging, which is all sort of push-based. Um, and so this is, is part, of the, part of the integration challenge uh, overall is that uh, unless you uh, want to go in and like hardwire something kind of straight to the data systems, you end up living with these sort of push messages, um, which means you kind of get what the vendor gives you. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the hopeful things about Fire is that sort of that client-server architecture means that um, uh, vendors will have to then have to, if, if you're making a request, they have to prepare the data in such a way that what is pulled out is what you're expecting. And uh, even though there are lots of ways you could break interoperability right now, even under that model, uh, the hope is that with the ONC and a lot of interest around this, they'll start kind of standardizing uh, the way that they implement FHIR. Because uh, it's Greenfield, it's a, it's a, it's a new opportunity to, uh, to, to push for things. You know, there aren't 30 years of FHIR implementations that are all not in, you know, incompatible yet. So, go ahead. Yeah, well, question. So I haven't personally uh, you know, implemented FHIRE yet, but does it also have provisions for defining the content of the payload? Um, so the question was, does FHIRE have, uh, con yeah, uh, have uh, provisions for defining the content or payload uh, of what comes across the wire? And Josh is the man to answer that. Sure, so the, the main thing that FHIRE does, it, it does a couple things nicely, but the main thing it does is to define data models that describe exactly what the content or the payload looks like. So it's a collection of these resource definitions. But I would disagree there. The data model is, is a meta definition of the field. You don't have control over what comes over because that's pulled from the HR system. So I'm wondering, so, does, does it stipulate some sort of tight definition of that so that interoperability can really occur. So FHIR defines these data models, things like what does a medication prescription look like, or what is a blood pressure, or a lab observation, or an immunization, or what is a set of patient demographics, what do those look like? Those are the data models. And then FHIR defines a serialization for those models, so you know what's going to come over the wire in, in JSON or in XML if you prefer it. Uh, and it defines a REST API 
to access those payloads. So it's that full stack from the transport down to the way you serialize the data, down to the models that describe the data. Is that fair, or am I still missing something about the way you're characterizing no, this fair case? Enough. Okay. Um, cool. One thing that I'll say just really quickly about Fire, which is shouldn't strike you as funny, but it is funny in the standards development world, especially in the healthcare standards development world, is that this Fire community has taken sort of a backwards approach to things. They got a bunch of implementers together who actually wanted to try these specs out and they're driving the standardization process based on implementation experience. Rather than getting a bunch of academics in a room for five years, producing a set of Microsoft Word documents and letting the word out uh, and then hoping things come together. So it's been a really implementation driven experience. There's challenges taking that tack, but overall it's been quite fruitful. And this is part of the reason for not only the event, but for just the general sense that we hope that we'll do the call to action at the end, but uh, the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, is listening, and hospitals are listening, and um, there's, uh, so, so little of it has been widely implemented yet that there is a real opportunity for people who are actually trying to build solutions to meaningfully influence uh, what could be the spec that we use to transit data for, uh, for the next 10, 20 years, however long. Um, uh, this, so there's, there's a chance to have you guys at the table uh, providing a voice about how this can serve you to build better tools. Um, and that's that's sort of exactly what Josh was saying. So um, I'll try and, uh, clearly there's gonna be a lot of good questions here, so I'll try and blast through my, my noise as, uh, as, as fast as possible. Um, so this is, uh, I, I wanted to try to have an example of the integration pain point, like why is it so hard for startups to do stuff in healthcare, right? And so this is an actual, I, I anonymized this, but this is about a year old actual contract information uh, from a company that builds an infection control product um, uh, that was sold into a hospital where a, a family member of mine works, which is how I illicitly got their non-disclosed <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, but uh, they built a great product and they solve a real problem. Everybody knows we should be controlling infections and monitoring infections in hospitals. And they built a great tool that's been around for 10 years to do this. And this was, uh, this was the price that was given to the hospital to integrate this product uh, on their uh, nameless EMR vendor um, system, and um, and this is so the, the the discount if you guys can't see here is 200 grand, and so this is for a product that they charge 165 grand a year for. 160. So the the implementation fees, the integration fees exceed the one year cost of the product to the hospital, and this is sort of the upper bound of what this can do. But this is real. This is one year old, uh, straight off the word document. Um, and of course, uh, interestingly, as you guys are probably discovering as you're trying to build and sell things to hospitals, um, it turns out that their new EMR vendor, Epic, in 2018, is going to have an infection control module built into it. So there's a big debate at this hospital on why should we do this? Why should we buy this thing? When in four years, Epic's going to have a solution, maybe. Um, to, to, to something to something as straightforward, to something so just as obvious a patient need that costs the hospital money. I mean, the, the, the battle against infections in the hospital is the, the battle of all mankind uh, for out throughout the centuries. I mean, this is the crowning achievement of medicine is like, you know, uh, battling back infection. And these sort of integration fees, well, we can wait four years. Um, and so this is, this is a problem that probably all of you guys have kind of run into. So I was gonna talk a little bit about the solution landscape for this right now, and then kind of frame it negatively, and then why I think <laughs> Fire is probably the, uh, the, the way forward. Um, so these are, these are a number of the big integration engine companies that maybe you guys have run across. Um, and some of them provide these things as a service, some of them do the integration themselves, some of you have maybe been charged fees um, by them to, uh, to be integrated at a hospital. Um, and some hospitals, the bigger a system gets, the more likely it is they have their own staff that can do this. Um, so th there's even a chance that maybe somebody with like a, what is actually a pretty good product like Merck um, or interface where has their own integration staff and maybe you're not going to get charged a lot, but that also means that, that, that then means that you're 30th in line behind the other priorities that the integration staff is dealing with. So we'll do it. You can do it for free, but it'll be six months. And by the way, we don't pay you until we have like 90 day payments. So we're going to buy your product and in nine months you'll get your first check. Thanks a lot. Um, and these, you know, these, these are solutions to this problem, but they're, 
this is sort of the old way of, of handling integrations. This, these are just kind of custom field mapping uh, tools. So there's a handful of companies starting to flip the business model a little bit and doing like integration as a service. Uh, these are the startups that are doing it over here on the left. Um, interestingly, Catalyze and um, Redox are both funded out of the same incubator in Madison. They're kind of spin outs from the Epic community. Um, and Aikido is a new uh, Y Combinator company that's just springing up that's gonna start offering uh, certain elements of fire uh, in their product. I think that the Catalyze and Redox companies will very soon be offering um, uh, fire integration points, but they're basically just doing it as a service saying, we're not gonna charge you 100 grand to integrate your product, call us, and uh, we'll charge you 500 bucks a month for the duration of the life of your product, and we'll handle the integration, um, and you get a nice, reasonable, clean, modern API. And I think those companies will find some success because uh, just even if you're still paying them, just giving you something decent to work with is, is, a, is a big step up. Um, and they have a lot of integration expertise. So these are some other more established companies that are also doing this as well. And they're, they're real players, which maybe I thought maybe some folks here might not have heard of. Uh, so MuleSoft is very involved now with the UCSF. I think I believe they were purchased recently by Salesforce. Uh, and they're a big traditional like enterprise service bus company um, that traditionally is like the hospital manages its own integrations and APIs, um, but they've also recently started kind of going out of the integration as a service business. Um, and they're very big, you, you may not have heard, it's just old you know, Apache, basically commercial versions of a bunch of Apache Java products laying around, uh, but they're huge. Um, and you might see, you might come across them. Uh, uh, and Telechart is from the, um, the famous startup hub of Fort Mill, South Carolina. Um, and they offer integration yeah. services um, similar to like a lot of these other players and they have recently started going to integration as a service kind of at the hospital level, like you wouldn't call them to give you a clean API, but the hospital would say, okay, we want your stuff <coughs> and Telechart does this, do you want it or not? And you'll say yes. And they offer pretty reasonable prices if, if, you, if you check them out. Um, and then Elastic.io is kind of the big European player in this, they've raised a lot of money, they do a lot of this at the enterprise level in Europe. And I, I believe, looking at them, they're going to be kind of coming to the U.S. and trying to eat up the market here. Um, it, if, if you guys, so the, the total global integration market uh, for the reports that I read from free uh, being a student is about $3 billion or so. And in the U.S., this is a $2 billion industry just doing integrations. Um, so this, this, is a, this is a big deal and a, and a big expensive problem for a while. So these are the people causing the problem. Um, <laughs> and um, many of you would, oh. All right, there we go, can you hear me? It's a simple user interface on there. Um, yeah, so this is probably what you guys are maybe here wondering a little bit about is some of these guys, A, they have their integration points, but some of them are making noise about doing these sort of things. Um, and this is obviously one would one hopes would present an entrepreneurial opportunity for people to build cool stuff. Um, Relay is the IT branch of, uh, of McKesson. Uh, if you don't, uh, if, you, if you haven't heard of McKesson, uh, they're the biggest company nobody's ever heard of. Um, and interestingly, I learned in my HBS class this past fall that uh, Relay accounts for about four percent of McKesson's revenues and one third of its profits. Um, they do a lot of logistics and that kind of stuff. And McKesson offer, also offers big, big mainline heavy duty EMR products. Um, and they've been very slow to kind of move into this stuff, but if they decided they could go out and snap up a bunch of companies and become a bigger player uh, than they are. Um, uh, Allscripts has uh, traditionally been one of the biggest uh, EMR vendors. They launched an API thing and this, they, they sort of, of, the big vendors sort of kicked off the API effort. Um, and I, I know I, I, I spoke uh, in, in confidence with an outgoing Allscripts uh, uh, senior executive about four or five months ago who told me it's basically done nothing for them. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't done much for the business. And if you look around and look at the way that the API structure works and the sales channel, it hasn't done much for the business of the people that have built on top of that. Now, there are a couple of companies, there's a great company, HealthBench, um, that's doing stuff on top of Allscripts. Um, but it, it, uh, it, my impression is that the success of the companies that have built on the Allscripts API has been completely separate from the actual API providing them some value in an integration point. Um, uh, 
Uh, Greenway is also possibly a pretty big company that you haven't heard of. Um, they're more in the small to medium sized practice, practice market. Um, and they actually have a fully launched app store that I'll show you a slide of here soon. Um, uh, Meditech, um, we also, we all operate in this world of, uh, we live in big cities and work at big hospitals that are big academic hospitals and have large budgets and spend on things like Cerner and Epic. Meditech is actually the most widely distributed EMR, I believe, in the world. Um, and they're cheap and it's not uh, super user friendly, but they do a good job on billing and they keep the wheels running, they keep the wheels on the truck. And I think they have something like approaching 4,000 installs globally. Um, uh, so the bottom two players are obviously kind of the, the 800 pound gorillas in the, in the enterprise EMR market. Uh, Epic is about, uh, that you hear this number 50%. So about 50% of people in the US have been to an Epic hospital. But it's kind of like saying 50% of the US eats at McDonald's every day. Um, it's like 50% of us have shamefully gone there. But Epic doesn't, <laughs> Epic doesn't own 50% of the EMR market. They're in about 11, 1,200 hospitals total, um, and they have some of the highest value real estate. A lot of the academic medical centers, obviously Kaiser. Um, and I've been told uh, proprietarily they actually it's only like three or four hundred accounts, but because they're in so many systems, they, they they're now in about 25 percent of U.S. hospitals. Um, so Cerner is the other big player. Um, they uh, depending on how you split it up, uh, they're probably another 25 percent of the market. Between those two, it's about half. Um, Epic did about 1.8 billion in revenue last year. Cerner did three and a half. They offer a number of other smaller products that were in their major uh, EMRs. But um, those, are, those are the gorillas. And then Athena is sort of uh, maybe similar to Greenway with working its way up the stack. They started out as billing and small practice and they're working their way progressively into bigger and bigger enterprises. Um, and uh, their CEO, uh, Jonathan Bush, is uh, uh, a fun tweeter. Um, and all around entertaining guy, but uh, I, of, of the integration points that I have looked at the documentation for, uh, Athena offers the most sort of clean, modern API uh, that isn't fighting you that, that I've seen. Um, so uh, app stores, like, so we've heard, so Epic you know, announced unintentionally actually um, that they were gonna do an app exchange. Cerner's kind of made this store movement a, a, a central part of their business thesis. Uh, over the past year, um, and uh, all scripts has done the API thing. Uh, Relay is maybe considering it. Um, I know folks that are headed to work there this summer that can't really comment on it, but, and Greenway has, has also played, made an effort at this. Athena's platform is called More Disruption. They have the More Disruption Please platform uh, for startups, but they also um, offer like a, a pretty decent, just traditional API. Um, so is there gonna be a market for app stores? Can you build turn app store in a hospital and sell something that is gonna be integrated into uh, somebody's workflow or somebody's environment. And um, before I tell you no, um, I'll, show, I'll show you what Greenway's app store looks like. So this is the market, so this is on their homepage for their marketplace. This is the first thing that pops up. They've been doing the app store thing for about three years, four years, Josh. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is the top Greenway solutions, one rating, <laughs> two ratings. <laughs> Six. I cut out the, the third one over there. It says most popular overall. It's like ten eight zero zero. Um, and this is on this is on their homepage. So if you want to build an app for that market, go for it. Um, I, uh, I I encourage you. Um, so the Epic App Exchange. So Epic's uh, this is this seems like kind of a big deal, right? Um, so actually, if you look at their Fire documentation, you go to dopen.epic.com and you uh, want to learn about their Fire integration points. I actually think that Fire is gonna be the way they sort of organize this app exchange. Um, and I only know that because of just looking at the URL and if you look through Epic documentation, there's no mention of the word app exchange anywhere um, in anything except for that. So my guess is that their app exchange efforts, what they are, um, will be centered around the, the Fire sandbox. Um, uh, so this is a, this is a quote, uh, this is public knowledge. Um, about the app exchange. If you want to find out about Epic, just, uh, the CEO, Judy, is an amazing woman, uh, doesn't care about the media. Um, and uh, they're generally pretty mum on what they do. And the, the whole fact that they've got an app exchange actually wasn't really supposed to be released. Um, it was sort of unintentionally mentioned at a conference. Um, but I, I won't read this for you, but uh, it sounds similar to the efforts that they've made, like open, I don't know if you guys have looked at open.epic.com in the past year or two, but it's basically gonna be a list of vendors 
that you know will work with Epic if you want them. Um, and it's probably not going to provide a, a mechanism for you actually to sell something that's going to work in the clinic um, or be able to abstract clinical data. So uh, they will. It's essentially this fire, the sandbox effort, and the app exchange effort is going to be some work on their behalf to make it easier for you to know that your your application will work against Epic um, in advance. Um, but it's it's not really going to serve as a sales channel or a distribution channel. Um, uh, this is all. This is all what I know. You know, um, take it for what it's worth. So health kit. Um, uh, health kit is obviously cool, and Apple knows how to do apps, um, and they know how to support developers, and they know how to build nice integration points. Um, but right now, this is this is all they've kind of got for clinical data, and um, uh, that's a nameless quote, but that's an actual quote I got from some folks that uh, have, uh, know the health kit team, but. Um, uh, it's just not enough if you guys know if you guys have tried to build the clinical stuff this is just this is actually the majority of their clinical data types and you can't this this is gonna be great for the consumer market and great for people building kind of consumer facing apps but if you're trying to abstract some patient data or build something I, I don't I don't think in the near horizon and by near I probably mean at least the next couple of years that health kit is going to be offering integration points that can give you some real patient data or an authentication or security workflow that allows you to do something on the clinician facing side. It's going to be all kind of patient, uh, patient facing, out, like outpatient kind of stuff. Um, so, which is, who knows, maybe they'll accelerate and we'll all just have Apple EMRs and uh, stop shaking our fist at the sky so much. Um, <laughs> So, um, so what is fire? So the whole point. So if if if, if there's nothing for us here as builders um, in terms of the app market and the, the APIs, and I do believe the big vendors' APIs are getting better. They're putting more work into cleaning up their integration points. Um, but to me, if we're going to actually have one standard that everybody can build on, so you can build something and know that your stuff is going to work at the next hospital you take it to. Um, I don't see a very good option ahead besides fire. Um, and um, we talked a little bit about the restful, um, you know, the restful nature of it, uh, the fact that it makes fairly reasonable assumptions about how you would partition resources in a URL structure um, that don't require a degree in um, you know, resource modeling to understand. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and let Josh comment on, um, uh, so, so maybe I'll ask you specifically um, to tell us, a, tell us a little bit about uh, where it's been, kind of where it came from, and um, where you think it's headed as somebody who, who looks at it quite a lot. Sure, well, I'll say just a couple things about the project. Uh, and maybe the most important thing is, back in 2011, I gave a talk at the, at the Health Level 7 International Conference in the great international destination of Orlando. And uh, I, I gave a talk in which I effectively showed a set of slides uh, to the HL7 community explaining why we just weren't using their stuff. Um, and it was a pretty simple story at the time. And number one is we wanted to build an open API and the stuff wasn't open. We couldn't even copy and, and publish the documentation. Uh, number two, it wasn't free. You had to buy it. And you had to buy a whole stack of specifications before you could even really make sense of it. Uh, number three, it, it didn't really make sense. Even if you bought the specs and read them, they were exceptionally hard to interpret. Um, and number four, even if you managed to interpret them, there was just a lot of stuff that they wouldn't help you do. Um, so if you wanted to capture blood pressures, and you know, you could say maybe the systolic value was 120 and the diastolic was 80, but if you wanted to say what size blood pressure cuff was used or was it taken in the arm or the leg, all that kind of stuff was not represented in a, in a standard way. Uh, so around that time in 2011, HL7 launched this thing called the Fresh Look Task Force that was supposed to just sort of think new and different about how to work these standards. And as you can imagine, the task force sort of sat around and people scratched their heads for a while and, and talked with a bunch of big ideas and you know, everybody sort of went home. <laughs> and then, you know, maybe six months later, um, a couple of folks in the community started actually building something. They started reading documentation for some web APIs in the uh, consumer space, um, tools that did um, customer relationship management for big, big companies. And they said, you know what? Uh, the healthcare needs aren't that different. We could use these patterns. Um, they started building out a couple examples, very simple to start with just a couple data types, like patient demographics and lab results, and that was it. For like a year, those were the only data types. And I sort of looked at it and said, well, that's cute. 
if there were 30 data types instead of two, uh, we could sort of use it. And I sort of closed my laptop and, and kept on my, my day job. And then about a year later, I looked back and there were 30 resources. And I said, well, I guess I gotta put my money where my mouth is. And I got involved and I, the great thing about this community is it's really driven by implementation and the learning uh, that implementers experience. So I, I built the first open source implementation of a fire server. Uh, and there were you know, dozens of things along the way that I thought, well, this is, this is terrible. Why does it work this way? And I joined the Skype chat and the mailing list and, and started complaining in public. Um, and then I started participating in the official standards development process. Uh, and the good thing is I was actually able to get almost all of the things that I cared about baked into the spec. Uh, and it's something that I would encourage you, you, everyone to take a look at. Uh, have a look at the spec. There's a lot of stuff it does. There's also a lot of stuff that it doesn't do. But there's a really active community of people who care, uh, who are working on this together. Uh, and what I'd say is to the extent that you want to use this in the real world, Fire gives you the tools to start with what's there, to extend it as you need, uh, and there's an open community around improving it as we go. And that has been by far the most important aspect of it for me. Um, excuse me, thanks, Josh. Um, so I, should, I, I forgot to say, I, I, I do have, I, I'm not entirely a neutral player here. I do have a vested interest in that I, I'm uh, build, building a company that uh, does a lot of stuff around fire, so I, I hope that it becomes successful. But, um, <laughs> But I also, I'm also a student and a health policy management student, and this is also partly my homework, um, was to was part of my practicum was to like, uh, as, a, as a policy initiative, uh, this is how I've justified not having to take a class uh, this spring uh, by raising the word and getting the policy word out on fire. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I sent the blog post to my, you know, my, my practicum mentor and uh, it, it bought me, uh, bought, it's buying me some delayed paperwork actually. Um, so, uh, so, what's the, so what's the problem? So like why, why is this so important? It, so, so fire isn't just gonna happen. And that, that's why I'm a little scared and a little uh, trepidatious uh, that this isn't like fire isn't just gonna come here and save the world and make everything better. We can't just run around saying fire, fire, fire. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is legal. And don't do that in closed room. Um, uh, so the problem, the problem is, is so if, if you take a look at you know the way that just a kind of traditional URL, URL structure, are you uh, familiar with REST? Um, while the spec itself, if well defined, can can very narrowly bound what the data is going to look like and, and give us a, a much 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 further step towards interoperability, that doesn't mean that everything has to be done using Fire. Um, you don't, just, just because a company says that they're doing fire or, you, or it's an integration engine uses fire or an EMR vendor is using fire or they built an app store around fire, doesn't mean that you're still gonna be able to get the data you want and that, that the sort of functionality will, will, will be there. Um, because you could just not expose plenty of elements of, of fire to a given app. Uh, you could still kind of have this one-off negotiated well, we're a company, we want to do X, do you have a fire integration point for this? Okay, well, we'll set you up a little fire server that does this one sort of thing specifically. That would be $40,000, please. Um, that's still entirely entirely possible. Um, and I, so this is another quote, um, and I, again, won't name this person. Um, uh, so <laughs> um, I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about this, and, um, but so this is, this is from a, a friend of mine that works at a big academic medical center. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to note, so, so you'll note here that the fire support that is listed that isn't coming until uh, 2015. Um, so there is actually one hospital this year that will be on Epic 2014, and that's Partners in Boston, uh, with, which is paying about $1.3 billion for their total transition. Um, and they're getting the latest and greatest 24. And if you know anything about Epic updating, and again, I, I don't mean to malign Epic here now that I'm on camera. Um, I don't mean to malign Epic specifically. It, it's, I refer to the EMR, to the big EMR vendors as sort of like voting. Like you, you, like you just have to choose one and you're not gonna be happy about any of them. Um, and if I had to vote for somebody, if an institution, there's a lot of good reasons why you would go to Epic. It does a lot of things well and, and reduces a lot of integration pain, believe it or not for institutions that go to Epic and get rid of this super heterogeneous like EMR infrastructure that they have. So I, I don't mean to specifically malign Epic, but the update cycle for these things is two or three years typically. A, a place will run on a 2014 until 
2017, and then 2017 they buy 2018, and then by the time 2019 rolls around, they're on 2018. Um, so just because uh, fire is going to be represented in some data elements in our big EMR vendors doesn't mean they're going to go through the process of rebuilding their entire backend infrastructure to support a nice, clean fire API. So it, it's some of it's coming, and it's hopeful. But there, there's no, right now, there's no rule or law saying that some of this stuff is going to have to be similarly implemented across different EMRs. And uh, there's, a, there's a very good chance that you'll end up um, integrating, you know, being like, okay, well, this place has XYZ elements that we need that are represented in fire, but we're still going to have to hit the integration engine or pay an integration company to still, like, map out these other elements that we need for our app. Um, and that will kind of, I think, from a market standpoint, from a startup pain standpoint, that'll leave us in a similar place unless we get as much fire as possible. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, this will kind of what the, be the, will, what the landscape end up looking like, and I want to avoid this. So why, why am I here in addition to getting class credit um, for, uh, to, to, to promote this sort of stuff? Um, and it's because if we don't show up at the table as a startup community, as people that are trying to build and fix this stuff, other people will. So uh, I've been running around you know, pulling my hair out about this for a couple of years, uh, saying we, we need to be at the table. Um, but uh, last week, I don't know if you knew, it, it made the big news in Oklahoma a few weeks ago about this integration fee stuff. Um, and what, actually one of the only physicians in Congress uh, in Texas um, uh, put forward some, some regulatory language uh, on the 9th that if you, if you read it, is um, just not really congruent. It's you know an interoperability law that just doesn't really uh, take uh, understand the way that computers talk to each other. And it's just it's overly ambitious. It's very vague um, and in the same way that some of the meaningful use requirements that have been kind of pros and cons um, are. It, it, it's, it's the right thing. It's the right idea. Yes, we should have interoperability. But the, the description and the, and, the, and, and the regulations itself is, is just not in line with how computers work, <laughs> um, and and so it's 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 really is up to us, and as uh, certainly I, I, my hope is that the Rock Health community and you guys out here will, will pay a lot of attention to this because the ONC is really listening, uh, very, and they really really are. The people at the ONC are good humans. Uh, they want the health system to work. Um, that's their job. And uh, right now, at a lot of the meetings, people just aren't showing up. The, the letters aren't coming in. The emails aren't flowing. And so, so hopefully, the, we, we've made the case that uh, integration is horrible. It's bad for your startup. Fire is better. We should support that. <laughs> um, and that's sort of the uh, that's sort of the take home point. Um, and uh, after that, I'm sure there's going to be a million questions. So I'll just kind of quit talking and ask if you have anything that you want to add to that. Um, and then we can feel Q and A. Now that I've turned on my microphone, maybe. Uh, let's just jump to q and I think. Well, I'll say one thing about the ONC really quick. Yeah. Um, I can't uh, punctuate what you said more about letter writing. Uh, so un fortunately and unfortunately for the ONC, they have a process, and it's the typical American bureaucratic process. So to get stuff changed, you really actually have to write the letters. You have to go to the public comments. And, and unfortunately, Epic, Cerner, and all these companies are there in spades. And so it's just the way it has to be done. So you have to get your voice out there, and you have to meet with the ONC. And you meet with them, and they'll say, here are the 11 um, uber painful public comment sessions that we need someone to be at, and get 4 million letters from everybody in the community. And it's a lot of work. So it's going to be a lot of grassroots. So it, it's an extremely important point. And just to, to follow up on a couple of opportunities, if you really do want to get involved, ONC published something called the Interoperability Roadmap, um, along with a 10-year vision for how to, how to get there. And they're in an open comment period right now. One of the cool things they did with the roadmap is they attached a version label to it. They said, this is the roadmap version 1.0. And the idea is this is a living document that's formed by the community and by feedback over time. Uh, so take a look. Um, it's not exceptionally long. It's, it's probably 70 pages, though. And uh, we're in a comment period that ends on April 3rd. Um, so have a look and, and share your thoughts. Uh, 
The second big opportunity is one that we don't know exactly when it's coming up, but my guess is that it will be coming up within the next month and maybe a little bit sooner than that, which is the next set of meaningful use notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, and then the corresponding EHR certification criteria that will go along with it. Uh, and so CMS publishes the former, and ONC publishes the latter, and there's a public comment period on both. Um, and they look at every comment, and they reconcile them, and they do use those comments, and in, in some cases they make substantial changes to between what's been proposed and what they eventually put into the final rules. So it, it really is an opportunity to have your voice heard. share one uh, quick thought. So the project that I work on is called Smart Platforms. Uh, and, and so we decided that interoperability as a, as a word um, wasn't doing us any good because it gets such a bad rap because you say things are interoperable but then they don't really work. Uh, so we did that the thing that's so useful in marketing which is to throw it away and invent a new word. Uh, so we invented the word substitutability uh, which got a, we tried to get across this idea that we want these apps, we want the apps that we build on top of EHRs to be substitutable. So if you're running a clinical system and you see somebody's built a better new app to you know, manage your patient list, you should be able to throw away your old one and install a new one and, and swap or substitute one app for another. Uh, so in some ways, interoperability you know, just sort of means that all the systems will talk to each other, but it doesn't say anything about what the end users will get. Uh, and I think part of the solution here is keeping the full stack in mind, saying what is it that end users can do when we've got these systems in place and not losing sight of the fact that we're trying to help patients and, and clinicians and everyone in this space actually get their jobs done better and make smarter decisions. Yeah, so the question is, are there guidelines for how the FHIR spec could be extended by implementers? Uh, and the answer is yes. The, the spec is designed to be extensible in a couple of key ways. So if you look at the FHIR specification today, uh, it defines about 50 resources that are part of the first draft. And there's going to be about 100 resources that are part of the second draft. And you know, that will probably continue to creep up over time. But there are these built-in extensibility mechanisms. So for example, if you want to add a piece of data uh, anywhere in a fire message, there's something called an extension uh, that you can insert at just about any point. And extensions identify themselves as being extensions, and every extension has a URL. So if somebody has never seen your extension before, they can go and look up that URL and learn what the extension is and who defined it and what it's used for and, and what it means. Um, and there's some safety mechanisms built in as well. So if it's safe to ignore an extension that you don't understand, the extension will explicitly be labeled that way. Uh, but, but, but there are other extensions where if you see it and you don't know what it means, you can at least recognize that it's not safe to interpret the data. Um, so there, there's that extensibility mechanism. And then in terms of defining new resources, uh, there's a couple of hook points where you can effectively say something that you want to say, even if it doesn't exist as a fire resource unto itself. Just kind of to follow up on that one, uh, with the extensibility stuff, uh, is there a mandate in the spec that the extensibility, like you said, has to provide that URL, or could somebody build an extension that's completely undocumented and then, oh, you have to pay $6,000 for the zillion page spec to repeat that? I'm thinking EDI here and how that's done, like, all the time. Yeah, so 
what the spec says, and what's very clear in the spec, is if you've got some instance data, I'm sending you this thing over the wire. For it to be valid instance data, if it's got an extension, the extension has a URI. Now, it's very possible that you might see that URI and try to put it in a web browser and it doesn't tell you anything. Um, there's best practices around the fact that those URIs should be dereferenceable, uh, but those are just best practices. In terms of the spec, though, every time there's an extension, there's a URL with it per URI. a couple words about what I think is the sweet spot for fire, uh, which is, and this is my personal opinion, there's, there's a lot of folks who want to do different things uh, with these specifications, and part of why they're useful is that they're so flexible. Uh, but for me, the sweet spot is focusing on the data that are just inherently structured, and that are stored as structured data within an EHR today, and yet are not accessible in a structured way or a consistent way from one system to the next basic clinical summary data, which are things like medications, allergies, immunizations, vital signs, lab results, all that kind of stuff that you would really like to be able to pile up and, and query and build models over, um, but it's very painful today. That's where I see the sweet spot. I think people will try to use FHIR to displace CCDAs, to displace a lot of traditional HL7B2 messaging, uh, but from my perspective, uh, the area where it's gonna be the most natural fit is when people want to build applications that can integrate against diverse EHRs uh, using a, sort of a modern web architecture. Um, and I think people will start wrapping around HL7B2 messages and building a bunch of mapping, and we can say, yeah, you know, this hospital is still talking to the 30-year-old lab system you know, using HL7B2 messaging, and that's good, and it's fine, and we're not gonna rip it out, but we might you know, tap that pipe and put a little adapter on top and give ourselves more options about how to interact with those data. So I have, a comment, I have a comment specifically on the HIE situation, which I think is really important um, to, to kind of help us uh, emphasize the point of why we need to be involved in the, in the FHIR regulatory process. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with health information exchanges, um, the, the state-based efforts and stuff that came out of high tech. And um, I think um, I'll, I'll do credit to Shiny um, that, has been, that has put a lot of work into to building out uh, some cool tools on, on top of their architecture. They're almost universally recognized as complete notes. Um, they uh, even in, even in Massachusetts, which has invested, um, even in Massachusetts, which has invested um, a, a lot a lot of money, and there's a lot of smart people working really hard to uh, get clinical utility out of the HIEs. Um, there's a there's a fundamental problem. I mean, this is this is an American health system problem as much as it's a technology problem. Is we we paid a bunch of uh, government contractors to stand up proprietary state-by-state state or region-by-region region networks, all built on heterogeneous technologies, all with no clearly defined clinical like uh, utility, and we're, we're now looking at studies on ACOs and whether or not people are transiting between ACOs, and uh, there's some good evidence showing that maybe this whole integrated accountable care structure idea, while uh, from a reimbursement standpoint makes sense to start driving outcomes, it turns out that people aren't living inside one ACO boundary that happens to be defined by local market conditions. Um, and they certainly aren't living their whole lives in one, in one particular vendor's HIE. 
And I think we're now seeing a perverse effect with the HIEs where we, we pumped a bunch of cash to create these entities that haven't provided as much value. And now they're, they've grown legs and they're spawning and they're going, we don't have any government money anymore. We got to look around. We're an integrator. Let's, we provide integration services uh, and uh, doing a lot of their own proprietary stuff. So I, I think that's a, that's a, was a political and economic outcome that I, I think was actually very predictable if you understand what was sort of mandated and asked to be done. Um, I don't see, uh, I, 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 my hope is uh, that, especially around, like he said, uh, like uh, CDAs, discharge summaries, basic sort of summaries of people's exit from a given facility, that looks like it's gonna be possibly fairly robustly supported uh, with, you know, by vendors uh, using fire. And uh, I don't wanna like sell you guys on a you know, peer-to-peer -peer hospital fantasy world of uh, you know, um, uh, Bitcoin uh, style, uh, uh, style interchange where we all just uh, uh, blockchain our ways to the, in, into the health. Um, but, um, but there's certainly no reason that if we, we had every vendor supporting a reasonable HTTP method to exchange discharge summaries, those could, not, those could then be much more easily aggregated by either a nonprofit or a state agency or um, uh, some non-federal big government thing that was actually just a federal big government thing that recognizes that healthcare, if we want to have continuity of care across settings and across disciplines, we need somebody to serve as the, the holding point for that data. And there's a bunch of startups springing up uh, trying to be your personal health record manager and they build great products, but I, I uh, maybe uh, may call me Marxist, but I, I just I don't see a non-government solution uh, to centralizing, creating some sort of centralized point, uh, or at least centralized uh, naming scheme, whereby these things can be transited around on the request. And it, it, it's certainly possible with fire. So, so you're promoting single payer nationally. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I. Uh, I, 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 will, I will say that the, uh, if we had passed the National Paperwork, Medicare, like Healthcare Paperwork Reduction Act, instead of the ACA, we probably could have shaved it. So this is an interesting point. Um, uh, Taiwan, I, I like this example. So regardless of the payment structure and incentives and that stuff, it's, it's a very telling anecdote that Taiwan in the, in the early 80s uh, was a developing economy, it was starting to grow up, and said, we want to look around, how do we modernize our health system? Uh, what do we do? And so they, they, they literally sent scholars around the world for two years to a lot of developed nations and brought home lessons learned. And in addition to being single payer, which there's reasonable people can disagree over that, um, they decided on a, not a particularly robust, but a, a, a national integrated IT infrastructure. Um, administrative costs in Taiwan for the healthcare system are estimated to be somewhere around three to four percent. Administrative costs in the US are somewhere around 25 percent. Just paperwork, legions of secretaries, all of us screaming about wanting our medical records, um, and a whole lot of people whose care is just absolutely blinded from physician to physician to physician. Um, and that, I mean, I, I think that's a, not only a technology issue, but an issue most of us here. Uh, uh, you don't have to be an extraordinary impact to think that that's a problem that we should solve. So I'm, I don't think it's yeah, I don't think it's I'm not as loud though. So I, I think there's also like sort of just to get public policy because I'm totally there with you for a second. I think that there's sort of a classic American um, business side to this too. I think that patients are getting frustrated with the lack of delivery on HIE. I think that implementers at large organizations are too. And so I think that opens up a big opportunity for us, um, at least in my new world, in the startup world, to really put not to be flipped, but a little bit of lipstick on the EHR pay here and sort of say, okay, the EHR does what it does, but now we're gonna leverage things like fire and other things to put a wrapper around it. And I think that's gonna be the new HIE, frankly, and I'm totally there with you. It doesn't need to be every lab test and every visit and every you know check of the heart that I do in the clinic. It really can be quite basic. It can just be patient level information that's very easily exchanged I think the health systems are there too. I mean, UCSF is currently investing in an integration platform using Salesforce that some of you may have heard about that's totally fire supported. 
And um, I think more and more institutions are going to do that. I think they have plans to make that available to other places. Um, you could consider UCSF as a place to pilot a fire-based app. But again, speaking to the lipstick on the pig thing, that's what we used to call the integration platform at UCSF in, internally, is it's just this idea that we're going to need a wrapper around this. And I think that's going to be what HIE will be, the true HIE. So, so first off, let me just validate all those comments, right? <laughs> these, these standards do not solve problems on their own, and it is always possible to trivially comply with standards, to trivially comply with certification criteria, and if the motivation is putting a bullet on your checklist of product features, you will find a way uh, to meet the criteria without really helping anyone get their job done. The best hope that I have seen is among larger clinical care organizations who have been building this stuff oftentimes internally for a long time, uh, but now are, are putting their heads up and looking around and saying, we cannot continue building our own EHR. You know, this happened at Partners. This happened at Intermountain Healthcare a couple of years ago. Uh, and these are savvy customers, right? These are customers who know what it takes to build an EHR because they've done it, um, and they simply don't want the maintenance burden. Uh, Mayo is another example in this space. And part of what they look for when they're shopping for an EHR system um, is a way to have a platform on which they can build. Uh, now the sad thing is none of the EHR vendors really offers that out of the box today. So for example, what Intermountain did, they wound up purchasing a Cerner system, but in the context of that purchase, they formed a collaborative partnership with Cerner. Basically Cerner said, we'll give you open APIs. We don't have them yet, but you guys can help us define them over a few years. And they set up an innovation fund uh, and they've been working together very closely. And that, at least, I see as a model by which these open APIs can be driven not just by vendors and not just by regulators, but by a collaboration where the end users who actually know what they need to build uh, have a say or have a stake in the game. Um, now, that doesn't translate very well to the hospital across the street uh, you know, in May Many Town, USA. But I think that we're going to start to see good, ha good things happening in that space. The other area I'll point to is in the outpatient world, where a number of ambulatory EHR systems are increasingly web-based, cloud-hosted systems where you can actually deploy changes across tens of thousands of users, uh, not over a year or two year upgrade cycle, but overnight. Um, and I think we'll start to see much better things emerging from the API integrations of those systems than we will from some of the big hospital integrated systems. Actually, uh, question for, for Tyler. So, I mean, in the, to, to your question around uh, moving beyond just check the box API support, like how did you guys back from think about why, what, what's in it for the EHR platform? Building an ecosystem around it as opposed to situations like the uh, infection control example of the uh, Okay. Why are you doing that? <laughs> I think that one of the benefits that we have in any I mean, full disclosure, 
your comment about like the business case and the hospitals that you use it, um, the my my also you know my secret business agenda um, was also inspired actually you know precisely because of that problem of going oh like this isn't going to be some company's proprietary API if I tell a hospital that I'm doing this you can fire this is going to be an internationally adopted you know HL7 just normal thing and it's a reasonable API um, and this we're not doing anything special we're not creating a full channel this is just something that all your visitors might end up using one day anyway. Um, so kind of let us do it this way, and then you can reap the advantages. And you know, this, this isn't um, this isn't some secret, untrustworthy uh, thing that's maybe associated with um, uh, some some perhaps uh, valid issues around security and control uh, that a big enterprise uh, is rightfully entitled to. Could you guys talk a little bit about? So, so Commonwealth is a, a collection, a, a collective project amongst electronic health record vendors uh, that was launched, or it was announced at the HIMSS conference, the, the big health industry trade show in 2013. Um, and the cool thing is by the following year in 2014, they actually had a group demonstration showing something working in three different EHR vendor systems. Same, same underlying network, accessible from three EHR vendor systems. Uh, so what was that thing? The thing is, the ability to look up information about a patient that you see, who might have been seen by different hospitals that had different EHR systems. And Commonwealth maintains, effectively, a, a centralized master patient index uh, that lets you look up where, ha where else has your patient been seen, uh, and then you can query one of those systems and say, what do you know about Josh? The really cool thing that they've done, uh, so number one, they're actually using some, some fire resource definitions under the hood. Uh, but the, probably the most, probably the most interesting thing about the, about the way that they've structured this is, you know, how do you do patient matching in a way that makes it safe and comfortable for everyone uh, at a scale like that? And the cool innovation they put was, let's put the patient in the loop. And so rather than just automatically allowing every hospital who has seen Josh to suddenly talk to one another, and rather by, than asking for blanket permission, uh, you know, on a release form. They actually have a workflow where the patient sits down with the front office staff and goes through a list. The front office staff says, here's five patient records that we think might be you. Can you confirm whether they in fact are you? And if so, are we allowed to talk to these five different practices to get the information that you have? And the patient for each of them says yes or no. And that's how they build out their network. There's probabilistic matching, but then there's explicit patient opt-in. And the data doesn't flow unless the patient explicitly opts in which I think is a really cool uh, twist. So far, all they're doing is allowing you know, one EHR user to query for clinical summaries, documents from other EHRs. There's no structured data flowing beyond that document level, uh, but they are in a position where they've built this network of trust, and over time, I think it would be natural for them to think about more granular data access, APIs and not just documents flowing over the wire. Question in the back. Yeah, so I, I can talk for a long time about Blue Button, and I'll try not to. Uh, but I, I've been very involved with the community that, that happened under ONC, for specifically for a project called the Blue Button REST API. Uh, but here's the bullet points. Blue Button started out as the idea that patients should be able to access their own data electronically. Uh, and that sort of worked. Um, basically, the VA and Medicare made it so that you could sign into a portal and download a text file with some information about you. And that was kind of cool. But folks looked at that and said, well, these text files aren't very well structured. And asking somebody to just download a file and save it on their hard drive is not really a great way to open up for third party integrations. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have automation and structured data uh, as part of this idea. And you know, I, I was part of a project that actually produced detailed technical specs to show how that would work. Um, and we got a lot of app developers coming to the table, consumer app developers, helping us define these APIs. What we didn't get was any EHR vendors uh, or any healthcare systems who said, we really want to expose them. 
Um, so we wound up with this very lopsided table. Um, part of Meaningful Use Stage 2 says that patients are supposed to be able to download structured data in one of these CCDA documents. Uh, so that's part of the regulations, and it's actually part of the EHR certification criteria. But it's not really automated. You have to sign into the portal and download the file. So you're still just downloading it. Uh, or you can trigger your system to send a direct message, a secure email, from your physician system to somewhere else, which is a great idea. But in the implementations that we see today, it doesn't work because there's this trust fabric that needs to be in place before system A uh, will allow itself to send a message from, to system B or before system B will be willing to receive the message. And in practice, nobody trusts anybody, especially patient endpoints. And so even though there's a button there that says send a message, uh, it doesn't work. That's where we are today. Um, I'm really hopeful that we're going to start to see regulatory requirements uh, so that actually let patients choose where they want to send their data rather than letting patients choose if their doctors also agree. So the, the question is, you know, even if we got this thing working, would the vocabularies be locked down enough that implementations would really work together? Uh, and the answer is, you know, if Blue Button does its job right, the Blue Button group won't be deciding on things like vocabularies. Instead, they'll be pointing to an underlying set of EHR certification criteria that themselves are detailed enough to give us that interoperability we need. So Meaningful Use Stage 2 and the 2014 EHR certification criteria uh, didn't go far enough, but they gave us the concept of a, quote, meaningfully use common data set, which was a set of data about a patient like where, you know, where they've been seen, what medications they take, what problems they have, you know, a list of discrete data elements, most of which had specific vocabularies that went along with them. Uh, so that's a good start, and I hope that we'll see that go quite a bit farther in the next stage of meaningful use. I don't know if we will, but I really hope we will. So, so universal patient IDs would be really convenient for lots of purposes. Uh, you know, we don't have them at the national level, and, and Congress is actually prohibited from investing any money uh, to develop a solution for this. Uh, so we won't see them uh, coming down from the national level, really, for, for patient IDs. But th there are actually a couple interesting projects that are happening right now. One is called NSTIC, National uh, can I do it? Society for Trusted uh, Identities in Cyberspace. I think I got the S wrong. Uh, but it's a, uh, you know, sort of, federated identity a, a approach to allowing patients to say who they are in a consistent way. I think we've seen a lot of good standards development work in the federated identity space. Uh, you know, in the consumer world, this manifests you know, with the, the sort of NASCAR buttons to say NASCAR buttons. I can log into this website with my Google account or my Facebook account or my Twitter account or my GitHub account. And I think we'll start to see more of that happening uh, in the healthcare space as well. It's amazing how nervous uh, healthcare delivery systems are about letting you sign into your patient portal using your Facebook account. Um, now, there's plenty of patients who have no interest in that, but there's plenty of patients for whom that would actually be a reasonable choice. Um, and from the healthcare system's perspective, you know, Facebook has a lot of security engineers that care about making sure the, the accounts aren't compromised and they have systems running on the back end to detect when bad things happen. They're actually quite a bit more sophisticated than most of the healthcare systems that manage their own sign-in. Uh, you know, and Google authentication lets you do second, second factor, you know, have a, have a token on your phone, which again is not, not a common feature. I don't, I don't know any patient portals that do two factor authentication. Uh, so I think we'll see more in that direction as well. But in terms of a single nationally recognized universal ID, it would be convenient, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. So I have a quick, so that's, that's a, just a central issue in all of this. And he's right, it's, it's very important to know that it's, it's not just not probably going to happen. Like Congress is specifically banned in very specific language from doing anything with national patient IDs. This is like a 10, 15 year old. Um, I think this was in PIPA in 96, actually. Um, I can't remember what year it came out, but 
that is that is a non-starter to have a federal ID, which is of course nonsensical from an informatic standpoint, but this, we live in the world we live in. Um, so uh, part of my uh, you know quixotic quest um, uh, on the past few years to, to to work on this has been to ask every person who seems like they know anything about this uh, what they've seen, what they've done. Um, and I was fortunate to, to work with a professor, a Duke professor when I was at HBS named Kevin Schulman, who spent three or four years of his life, 10 years ago, working to create a nonprofit trust with some of the big uh, self-paid uh, companies that have you know, GE. Um, and uh, there was a lot of interest from the, the, the self-insured companies on maybe doing this because they had a clear incentive to sort of get these things aligned. Um, and um, it just, the, the technology wasn't near that there yet, and it, 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 it just kind of ended up sort of unfortunately fizzling out. Uh, I'm having conversations with every single uh, school of public health, uh, Kennedy School of Government, um, any person on the street who will listen to me ask about it, about what they think about uh, a, a, an opt-in, uh, like national trust, a nonprofit uh, sort of situation. There's, again, there's a lot of startups springing up around specific verticals um, that will that will like serve as the way for you to mark your medical record and hopefully intake documents, which even now they most of them still can, um, uh, in order to provide a sort of a specific user experience for people that uh, that have either a uh, a a person or clinical need. Um, but I, I don't I don't think that we're going to end up with one company uh, winning the entire market for like personal medical record storage. Um, and that I would not see those companies necessarily being uh, aligned outside of legislative language to then share that data. Um, so my hope, uh, I saw somebody here was from the Kaiser Foundation. That w if, if we go to a fire-like world, the actual technical cost of storage uh, and you know, uh, a, a, a good OAuth protocol like SMART uh, to, to manage uh, people's data is essentially trivial. Um, uh, the, you know, this is this would be not even uh, a, a blink on uh, Google or Amazon or SoftLayer uh, storage budget to, to serve as a repository uh, for whatever n number of like patient records. But I, I'm very happy to hear and very happy to get anybody in touch with anybody uh, that I know that cares about this stuff because I just don't see a way around it um, outside some sort of national entity that people trust. Go ahead. So just on the flip side of that, I was wondering if you've seen any interest or activity in the single sign-on from the provider side for the brand. Yeah, so the question is about single sign-on on the provider side. Uh, you know, I probably can't comment on market trends, but I'll certainly say within within the large healthcare organizations, there's there's always some single sign-on system that, you know, is probably using a set of technology from a way back. Uh, I could tell you with the smart platforms uh, specifications, we're using OpenID Connect. Uh, and effectively, the contract is, if you're building an application that wants to plug into the EHR, uh, the EHR will allow the end user to sign into your app using OpenID Connect uh, and using their EHR sign-in, their, their account that they already have provisioned. Um, and we've gotten pretty good buy-in to that concept uh, amongst the big EHR vendors. So there's a, a project called the uh, Argonaut Project that launched last December, which includes Cerner and Epic and McKesson and Athena Health and Meditech. Uh, you know, a number of big EHR vendors who are supporting the development of these specs, um, and they're, they're very much on board with these security specs, including single sign-on. Oh, it doesn't work, okay. right? It's off now. I think it's working-ish. No, okay. That's one of my favorite questions, because it actually hits on what I call the difference between data integration and clinical workflow integration. Yeah. So a lot of times you'll be pitching a healthcare organization and some sort of, um, doctor or somebody will say, well, do you integrate with the EHR? And I always push them and ask them, well, what's your real question? Is it clinical workflow integration or is it data integration? And they're like, well, I don't know. I just want you to integrate with Turner. <laughs> and so they don't really think about it. But single sign-on, I think, is the single most important part of um, clinical system integration because it's about clinical workflow. So the big barrier, actually, to people adapting your technology very rarely has to do with true data integration because you have to ask yourself what actually has to be in the medical record and what doesn't. And that's really the undercurrent of a lot of this conversation is that things don't necessarily have to go back into the medical record. You need stuff to come out, and we've talked a lot about how that would work, but you don't necessarily need things to go back in. Not everything has to be in the medical record, but single sign-on is really important. So just as a little small tip 
for people working with Epic customers, you can actually run a wireframe, um, not, is it called a wireframe or an iframe? Iframe. Thank you very much. Um, that speaks to my tech savvy anyway. And, uh, so you can have that embedded within Epic and you can actually tap dynamic user and patient credentials in the URL through the iframe. So you don't actually have to do any integration at all. All you need to build is a secure way to pass URLs and you can have the patient um, context and the provider context embedded within that. And it's all possible in an Epic. And so that's sort of the hackish kind of integrations that people do. But the beauty of that is it's clinical workflow integration. And I think that that really truly is probably more important to your customers at the end of the day than true EHR um, push and pull. And so that, that's just one thing I would say about single sign-on, because I think it's a really important